troubleshooting call manager security issues. A big topic and a really cool topic on top of it all. As voice moves more and more to the mainstream, voice over IP I should say, we're going to see more and more security coming to the forefront. When I first got into call manager back in the 2.4 and 3.0 versions, it was <laughs> security was kind of like, uh, sure, you know, it, no, everybody was just impressed that you could have a phone with an ethernet cable attached. But as it's evolved and matured into a viable business solution, people are thinking, well, is it really good to have a phone connected to the internet and sending a, you know, skinny messages and G711 or G729 and clear text? Or what about our own you know, home networks? Looking at, uh, and I should say corporate home networks, you know, our LAN environments, can you, we trust our users not to open sniffers and things like that? And the answer to all those is usually no. <laughs> you don't trust anyone. So security on voice becomes a big deal. So I want to take a look at number one, reviewing how do we secure voice over IP. What security is possible using Call Manager? How we enroll a Cisco IP phone using the CAPF function, and we'll get into what CAPF is in the review section. And uh, the the name doesn't really imply what it does, so we'll talk about that. And then we'll look at troubleshooting the CAPF process. There's a lot to this, and I w I want to I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit it all in one nugget or if we'll bleed over to two, but we'll just keep going until we hit that time limit and go from there. Well, let's start off with the cliff notes, security cliff notes on how this all works. Now, this is detailed completely in the CIPT series, and there's nuggets dedicated to nothing but how security functions and how to set it all up. So I don't want to redo and reemphasize all of that, but I do want to give you the high-level overview to where if you've gone through that series, you'll go, oh, yeah, I remember all that. Or if you haven't, you'll go, eh, I think I get it. <laughs> so, four major areas of security. Number one, authentication. We've got to make sure that the servers in our cluster are the real deal. Meaning, there's a very good chance that somebody could, in a non-secure environment, you know, bring up their own little call manager server. Say you got your primary, your secondary, and someone just brings up a little uh, rogue server over here, and they trick your phone using spoofing and you know, poisoning the TFTP files and all that to use that as the primary server. Set up some trunks over here to where those uh, function as the, you know, it kind of relays it through and they can forward the calls through. So nobody really knows that it's happening. By the time it's said and done, they can do some pretty horrific things with the phones. So you want to make sure that all of these servers are authorized and that the phone knows what servers belong on the network. And that's the idea of authentication. The Cisco CTL client handles that. Certificate trust list. We'll talk about that. Th this is the overview, so I'll get more into it in depth. We also have to worry about our media and signaling encryption. Not only the audio, the media itself, when I'm talking on the phone, I want to make sure if somebody grabs those packets, with uh, Wireshark and actually uh, Kane Enable, latest and greatest hacking utility. Uh, well, it's been out for a while, but very common one. Can now take G711 phone calls and convert them into WAV files. Very similar to that Vomit utility, voice over misconfigured IP telephony I was mentioning earlier in the series, but Kane Enable makes it easy. Vomit, you actually have to know a little bit about what you're doing. Um, so we want to encrypt the, the voice, but we also want to encrypt the signaling, meaning all the si skinny or SIP signaling that our phones are doing have to be scrambled so people can't grab them. We also want to make sure all CCM administration uses SSL. And the good news is this, this is done for us out of the box. From the minute Call Manager installs and starts up, you're using HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash for everything. Um, so SSL is used by default. And then finally, we have CAPF. I mentioned that on the previous slide. The Certificate Authority Proxy Function is what that stands for, which makes it sound like, oh, this must be a proxy for you know, security of some kind and it's not really. <laughs> what this is, is it's a certificate authority, meaning something that issues certificates to the phones. So that the phones have certificates to use for security, they are trusted, they're authenticated. It's essentially the backwards authority to not only say the phone needs to trust the servers and know using the CTL client uh, what servers are allowed in the cluster, but the servers also need to know, hey, you are an allowed phone and I trust that you are allowed on this network. All right, here is my challenging slide for the series. I'm going to attempt to explain how the IP telephony security thing works in one slide. <laughs> There, there will be more slides, but it'll just get into more of the specifics of this. So here's the idea. We've got phones. 
and they need to communicate with TFTP servers, publishers, subscribers, and not, let's not forget other phones as well if we're talking on the phone to somebody. Uh, and we want to be able to communicate securely. So we want to encrypt all of the data going between them. Now, there, the way that we need to do that is by using an encryption key, or I guess specifically an encryption formula. Now, there's two types of encryption that we can use. There is what's known as asymmetric and symmetric. Asymmetric is super secure, like insane level of security, because you actually use two different keys, one for encryption and another for decryption. Now, insane level of security also means insane level of processing time. So we just can't use asymmetric encryption all the time because while it is very secure, it will kill the processor of, of all the devices using it. So what everybody uses in modern times, or I guess you could say for normal, excuse me, normal communication, is symmetric encryption, which just uses a single key for encryption and decryption. It's not flawless security, like unbreakable, unbeatable level of security. I mean, and this is the typical security we hear of every day, like 64-bit or 128-bit or even 256-bit encryption levels with a single key uh, to encrypt and decrypt data. It's not, it's not an insane level encryption, but by golly, it's good enough. I <laughs> just say by golly. 128-bit um, encryption is just, it's pretty much our standard nowadays for secure websites. It's, just, it's considered virtually unbreakable by modern processing levels. Now, 256-bit encryption is starting to emerge and starting to be like, oh, wow, that's, that's really secure, and you're starting to see it used here and there. But just about everybody, uh, for most applications, uses 128-bit encryption. And it's done using a symmetric single key. So here's the problem. We want to use this single key to encrypt and decrypt data, but we have to get that key from this device to this device, or vice versa, somehow, over a clear network, right? Like, let's say this device generates that encryption formula, or that symmetric encryption key. Well, you have to get it to the TFTP server, or you have to get it to the publisher or the other phone that you're communicating so that they know the encryption formula, but you can't just, you know, chuck it to him like here hey here you go because anybody along the way that sees that will go oh sweet I got it I've got that encryption key so what we use in our modern levels of, of security actually let me just do this what we use is a mix of both encryption types a mix of asymmetric and symmetric encryption we use asymmetric encryption for the initial security because it's got two keys and it's really strong and then we use symmetric encryption for all communication after that because it's much easier on the processor and still a really good level of security so here's how this security thing works all of these devices have certificates now what is their certificate Certificate is kind of a logical term we use for this grouping of security items. A certificate has a device's public key, which you can see right here next to all the devices. We'll, we'll call it the public key, which is just an encryption formula slash de-encryption formula. It has the device's signature, like this TFTP server would sign it, saying, I am the TFTP server. And then it has a stamp of approval, meaning somebody has to approve the certificate as being valid. Like, this is a valid device. We all trust this device. Now, in the, in the real world, like, let's say you go to a secure website. Uh, before we even get into this level of security, let's say you've got your PC sitting at home, and you go to www. we'll say wellsfargo.com. No, they did not endorse this series. I just chose them. So you go to wellsfargo.com for your online banking needs. Now you open Internet Explorer, and what Wells Fargo does is they send you their certificate saying, we are an approved website. Now, Internet Explorer accepts this certificate and doesn't pop up any warning or security violation messages because that has been approved and signed by someone like VeriSign, which is a trusted entity on all the internet that all Internet Explorer, Firefox, Mozilla, Op uh, Opera, web browser, and Safari, they all trust VeriSign. And VeriSign has been paid to go to wellsfargo.com and verify that they are the real deal. 
WellsFargo.com really is Wells Fargo. If they hadn't, then Wells Fargo would have to generate their own certificate. And I'm, I'm really mentioning this heavily because we're going to see that plays into uh, our security for our voice over IP. Wells Fargo would have had to generate their own certificate. And what would happen is Internet Explorer would be like, whoa. And y you've seen the message. I'm sure you have. When you're surfing the Internet, it pops up and it says, hey, this certificate has an error. And it gives you this listing of all the errors. And it says, this certificate was not signed by a trusted entity. That's usually what it says. And, you, <laughs> and people, you know, this is how good our security works, right? We all are like, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. And you, you get to your website because that's what you really want to do. But the point is that the certificate wasn't validated by somebody you know, paid to say that these people are who they say they are. So let's continue the story. You go to wellsfargo.com. They send you the certificate. Internet Explorer goes, yep, it's an approved certificate. I won't pop up anything. Uh, yep, it's Wells Fargo. They've signed it. And yep, we've now got this public encryption key. Notice I said encryption key that we can use for our session. Now, this public key is well known. Anybody going to wellsfargo.com can get this encryption key. It's, you, you, you can grab it. So here's what happens. Internet Explorer will then generate a session key, one of those symmetric keys, right? Security is not as strong. We'll say it's 128-bit level of encryption. That's typically what's used. Generate a session key, which can be used to encrypt and decrypt data. It's a single key system. And then they will encrypt the session key with the public key of Wells Fargo, right? Shoop, 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 shoop. The session key is now encrypted. Now that is sent over the public internet in an encrypted fashion to wellsfargo.com, who decrypts it using their stashed private key. Now who gets the private key? No one. Ever. Ever, 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 ever. Only that server has the private key because if that were to get out, all the security that Wells Fargo would, would have would be compromised. People would be able to break the, uh, the encrypted session keys and thus would be able to get the session key and get to what people are doing on the web. So no one ever gets this private key except wellsfargo.com, their server and their server alone. So they decrypt that session key that you just sent them. Now let me unscribble it. Unscribbled. So they now have <laughs> the session key over here that you generated, and then that is used for all future communication during that session. As in, if you were to close Internet Explorer and reopen it, your, your secure session would be done, and you would have to generate another session key. It, that session, that's, why it's, you get it, that's why it's called a session key. So that is the idea, is this public key is given to everybody, used to encrypt session keys that's being used for that session uh, it's so that you can get that secure communication. Now let me just throw something out there because I know some of you think like me. Um, when I first saw this described, I thought, oh, whoa, 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 wait a sec. You can't, you can't do that. You can't give this encryption formula out, this public encryption formula to the general public world and say, you know, that's now secure because can't somebody get this and like figure it out? I mean, I've taken algebra, right? <laughs> One plus X equals nine plus, you know, five, you know, and we figure out what X is, right? There's my advanced formula. So that X it would equal what? 13? Right, <laughs> I got it. See, see, can't you can't you just get this little x plus five nine formula here and just figure you know reverse it and now get what the private key? Can't you reverse generate that system? And that is why people far smarter than me, <laughs> and I'm glad for it, are the people who came up with these public keys. It is feasibly impossible to get the private key just based on the public key because they're using stuff in there far beyond typical mathematics and you know logarithmic functionality diffie hellman algorithm stuff right I, I this is beyond my brain so i can't even describe it to you it's beyond your brain most likely unless you can you can handle stuff like that there are there are volumes of books written on why you cannot reverse engineer this public key but just take my word for it, or you know, take some take some time and read some books. It is feasibly impossible to get the private key if you just have the public key. So that is why the security of the world, all our internet security, is based off of that algorithm, and it's still to this day not able to be broken. So, with that in mind, that's the idea of certificates and how this public key system works. So now let's bring the focus back to our voice over IP network. 
with that description of how it works on the internet when you're surfing wellsfargo.com, it's the same kind of thing, but applied into a voice network. All of these servers have certificates. But notice, I mentioned up there, they are self-generated certificates, self-signed certificates. So everything about these certificates just have self written on all over them. The TFTP server came up with this public key. The TFTP server signed the certificate, and then the TFTP server validated its own certificate, that's the self-signing, validated its own certificate and said, I approve this message. So is that really secure? Well, kinda, in the sense that it gives you a public key that you can use for the security, but it, it lacks one major thing. It lacks the fact that when the TFTP server gives the phone the certificate, the phone can really trust it, because if the certificate is signed by the TFTP server, generated by the TFTP server, then what's to keep somebody else from bringing up their own little TFTP server here and saying, I now have uh, my own certificate as well. Trust me. Well, we'll talk about what what prevents that whole thing in just a moment. For now, I just want to talk about the certificates. These certificates are generated by these servers and used for the security. The phone itself, these phones are amazing. They even have a certificate of their own. It's a little certificate. Um, it is one of two certificates. One is a manufacturing installed certificate, or you'll see this documented in Cisco Docs all the time as MICs. Cisco doesn't like MICs. They're there, and they're good, and they work, but Cisco will tell you right up front, they are designed just to, just to give you a base level security. It's better than clear text kind of thing, but they recommend you not use MICs as soon as possible. Rather, they would have you use a locally significant certificate, or an LSC. You'll see, again, that in documentation all the time in Cisco security. Uh, an LSC is one that's generated by your network, meaning... When you pull the phone out of the box, here's the box, and you open it up, and you pull it out, and you say, hey, I've got a new IP phone, it will, if it's a brand new one, it will have an MIC from Cisco. Cisco put it on there for you. But it's a generic MIC. I mean, they don't come up with unique MICs for every phone. So you, this phone probably has the same MIC as some phone in Saudi Arabia or Taiwan or you know Australia, wherever else in the world it is. You'll probably find duplicate MICs uh, that are out there. And they're just... they're generated by Cisco. It's like generic security. It's not a security. LSCs are ones that you generate using da 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 da. It's time to bring that term back in. The CAPF. Certificate Authority Proxy Function. That's that word again. That is the service that runs on a server in your cluster, most likely the publisher, that is going to be generating certificates for the phones. Now, how do you get that certificate from the CAPF server onto the phone? Uh, talk about that later. <laughs> Sorry, I was just, I was thinking, no, I have a slide. I'm not going to do it again. I have a slide just dedicated to, to that. But do, do you see the process? So, so let me back up. Let me back up. Where was I going? I was going right here. Um, how does this whole thing work? Well, if the, the servers have certificates and the phones have certificates, then that's all we need. Here's the idea. We've got a phone that makes a call to another phone. First thing that happens is it signals to the call manager, right? So it's got, it will get, through magic, we'll talk about it in a second, it gets the publisher or the subscriber, whatever server it's using, it gets its certificate. So it has the public key of the publisher. So this phone generates its own little session key. Remember that symmetric encryption, just like the website's we were talking about before? Generates a session key, encrypts that using the public key of the server and sends that up here. The publisher decrypts that session key. Ta-da! We now have the session key that it can use for the skinny signaling. So now all the signaling that will be passing between the publisher and this phone will be secured using that session key and now we've got secure signaling. Two phones call each other. Ring ring. They both communicate, do the same thing with the server, you know, get their secure signaling. But now the server we'll say the publisher in this case, will pass the session key over to this phone securely to where now these two phones have a session key between each other. And they can, they've got that shared session key and they can make a phone call securely encrypting all of the RTP audio, all the codec G711, G729, whatever they're using, can be all secured using that session key and communicated between those two. Now isn't that pretty cool? 
that's the basics. That's the basics of how the security works. So now we get back to that question I brought up just a moment ago. How do you know which servers to trust? Meaning, if the publisher, the subscriber, the TFTP server, all these servers generate their own certificates and they're all self-signed, so there's no real authority saying these are the good servers, how do they get trusted? I mean, how can you really trust those servers? Well, that's the idea of the certificate trust list, meaning each phone will get a certificate trust list. And I've got my little scroll here. This scroll represents who is the trusted servers in the cluster. On that certificate trust list, for instance, it might have the publisher uh, listed out and it'll have the publisher's certificate. It'll say, this is the publisher. It has this name, this IP address, this public key, this, you know, uh, other stuff, uh, other unique stuff that identifies that publisher. So if some other server, you know, I was mentioning someone brought up a rogue publisher or rogue TFTP server, another TFTP TP server comes up and says, it's me, I am the TFTP server you want now. I've got my own certificate as well. Uh, the phone will look at that and go, whoa, you're, you're not the same guy. You're not the same guy as what I had on my my trust list here, my certificate trust list on, on the scroll. So I'm not going to trust you. I will reject you uh, as being an authoritative server for the network. So how do you create the certificate trust list? That's where you use the CTL client that ships with Call Manager. It's a little application. It's, it's part of the, if you go to that little add-on screen, the plugins, you run it on Windows. And what you do is you actually import all of the, the certificates from the servers that you trust. It's a one-time thing. You go through and you say, I trust that publisher. I trust that subscriber. I trust this. I trust that. And I say all these servers and I import them into the CTL client and that will generate the scroll. It'll generate that list that is sent to all of the phones. Now you guys remember, let me uh, bring it up again real quick. Give me a second. You guys remember this phone. It's, uh, it's booting up right now. One of the messages that it had, let me go to the status and hit status messages, it said CTL update failed. No CTL install. CTL, and I, we're going to get these messages all the time because my cluster right now is not set up for security. So the phone itself is saying, I, I'm expecting or I'm hoping, not really expecting, but I'm hoping for a CTL list so I can say who's trusted. But since you're not secure, I'm not getting one. You know, no CTL installed. The update failed. I'm not getting one, so I guess I'll just trust everybody. This, this network that I'm running right now is not secure because I don't have a certificate trust list. I haven't used the client to generate uh, that list. So the phones are always looking for it. And as soon as they got one, then they will only trust the servers that are in that list. Now, what if, what if you add another subscriber to the network in the future? Or you, you know, take a publisher out and put a new publisher in? Well, that means you have to go and regenerate this list. You have to add them to that list, regenerate it, send it out to all the clients uh, that will need that list. And sometimes it can be a pain because, for instance, the TFTP server, I don't know if you can see, it's very little. It says TFTP right here. The TFTP server is in that list. And that's how the phone gets its CTL list. So if you uh, change your TFTP server and swap that guy out, you have to generate a new list, but it's, you know, it's not going to trust the TFTP server that gives it the list. So you actually have to erase the CTL from all the, the, all the phones. It's, it's a pain. You have to erase the old one, create a new one, import them all. But who said security was easy and that security would not be a pain? It is very painful, plenty of time. So this certificate trust list is how the phones know what servers to trust. Now let me talk about the specifics of getting the Cisco IP phone secured. Two ways that they can have a certificate. One is they can get the MIC from Cisco. Remember that manufacturing installed certificate? That is the one that ships with the phone. And so I guess you could say that phones are secured out of the box. They have a certificate. It's got a public key that it can exchange with the publisher. It, it can do security out of the box, at least the new ones. The old phones don't have MICs. Uh, the second way that they can get secured is by using the LSCs, the locally significant certificates. These are the ones that you generate using the CAPF. And there's two ways that you can get these to the phones. One is you can do an auto deploy system. And what that means is you take a little more risk and have a little less work. The phones on your network, here's your network, you know, all the phones that are attached, can be issued a LSC certificate all at once from the CAPF on your 
publisher server, the certificate authority proxy function. You can go in there and say issue certificate now. And immediately all the phones, well, as time progresses, all the phones will download and get a locally significant certificate that they can use to uh, secure their communication with all the servers and phones on the network. Now, the auto deploy takes a calculated risk by saying, I am assuming that all the phones plugged into my network right now when I click this deploy button are good. And if they are, that's, that's great. You've now secured your network. But if there's a phone on your network that somebody just plugged in and got an extension, it's a little rogue phone sitting in somebody's cubicle, well, that will just get a certificate and now move its way in as an approved phone. See, one of the good things about these certificates functions is you can say, you know, down the road, once, once I've done this auto-deploy and all the phones have certificates, somebody else adds a phone to the network, you know, here's our rogue phone, it's going to come up and say, sorry, you're rejected. You don't have a certificate. You can't communicate with these phones. You can't communicate with the servers. You don't have, you are not a blessed phone to have a certificate from the CAPF. So if that phone happened to be plugged in the network and got one, now it's in. It can communicate. The manual deployment method, which is a little more work but less risk, generates a code for every single phone. So when you go to the phone and you turn on the security from the call manager, under the phone itself it will say, okay, the security code is 15921159 or something like that. And you actually go to that phone physically and go to the, you know, security screen, say download CTL or or you know, turn enable security, turn it on from the phone and then type in that code at which point it communicates with the call manager says, "Here's my code. It verifies this is the code indeed. I will now send you this certificate." So you can imagine in a network of a thousand phones, it's going to take you a little longer to do it that way. What usually happens is you'll auto-deploy security for the initial deployment of it, meaning just turn it on, assume that the network is good and kosher, and all the phones on it are supposed to be there, and then from there on out, manually deploy the individual phones afterwards. So, And you could do auto-deploy, but again, it just is more risk every single time. But if you, once you add one phone here, one phone here, one phone here, it's a lot less work to go and just type in a code for a single phone than a network of a thousand phones. All right, the last thing I want to do is I wrap up this nugget because I'm not going to be able to cover all the security stuff in a single nugget. There will be a part two. Uh, is talk about a secure phone conversation, kind of end to end, to put all these pieces together. So we have phone A and phone B in this story. Phone A picks up and calls phone B, and in between them is a call manager. As soon as that call goes forward, it signals to the call manager saying, hey, I'd, I'd like to make a call. Call manager says, could you please send me your certificate? So certificate goes one way. Call manager sends back its certificate the other. So we actually have a two-way certificate exchange. The phone makes sure that the call manager is who it says it is, and the call manager makes sure that that phone is who it says it is and has a valid certificate to communicate. Now the call manager looks at it and says, okay, you look good. Let me make this phone ring. Phone, here's my certificate. So this is third exchange. Phone comes back and says, great, here's mine. Fourth, now ring. Ring. So you've got uh, the, the phone ringing, the communication going through. Now, in between all of that happening, the phones generate their TLS session keys. That stands for Transport Layer Security. That's the little symmetric encryption key, encryption slash decryption slash hashing. Hashing makes sure that nothing changes in the, in the uh, flow of the conversation, like packets don't change from end to end. So they generate their session keys and send them to the call manager, now encrypting it using the public key that the call manager sent it. So now we have the session keys sent over to the call manager, that's, that's this guy right here. Um, and the call manager connection is now considered secure. The call manager then sends those session keys down to the phones, who do some magic, put all the keys together, and generate uh, the session key that's going to be used to communicate between the two of them. Now the call is established between the phones. Uh, the call manager generates and sends, and here we've got the secure RTP, you'll see SRTP, that's encrypted RTP audio, uh, session keys to the phones. The phones now have that uh, generated key, that's what I was talking about, I was getting ahead of myself, that they can use to encrypt all that RTP audio between them. They can now communicate using secure keys. And since we've had this exchange, the call manager's got the session keys, the phones have derived their own session key, everything is secure for that session. As soon as you hang up, 
Those session keys are flushed, never to be used again. So the next call will have a completely new set of encryption keys uh, generated by the phones and even used for signaling between the call managers. So this is a very secure system. And as I mentioned, that's where I have to leave things. <laughs> I didn't get very far at all. There won't be a part three, though. I think I can, uh, I can wrap up those last two in the, uh, in the next nugget. What we have seen is how to secure voice over IP a review. And I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, that gave you a good either uh, cram session review of, of the uh, CIPT series where I dove in and talked about all that security and all its glory. And if you haven't seen the security before, I hope you now have a good idea and go, oh, okay, I've got a good idea of how it works and the processes behind it. Because you'll need that knowledge as we start getting into the enrolling the phone, how, you know, how to make this security work, and of course, the troubleshooting process. So for now, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.